Just hand me the box behind there. Thank you. Lyle. Lyle's on? All right. There's five people on. <coughs> Dana. It is seven o'clock. As you can tell, Pammy and I are trying to try out some different paints. Can you see the little paint splotch on oh, there? A little bit. And I got to have this on there. Rick always asks me, am I moving to a different place because of my pole? And I'm going to add some details. Uh, I like the feedback that I get from some of you, not only online, but even afterwards, because some people watch it afterwards. So had somebody last week ask me about something that we're going to bring up tonight. Um, so we're going to be in uh, John 12 tonight. Glad you're with us. Uh, for those of you who aren't, if you don't live in Burlington, you may not know. Uh, I see Catherine and Jackie. Uh, Jackie used to live, Jackie and Barry used to live in Burlington. We got some snow today. Our first big snow of the year. So we're supposed to get more this week, right? Friday? Possibly. Possibly. So, so welcome everyone. Pam can help me out on uh, who else gets on. Connie. Connie's on. Great. Gloria. Gloria and Dana. Renee. Probably Gloria and Tom. Renee. All right. Lyle. Dana said, is there a microphone adjustment? Hmm. Uh, let me know. Give me a thumbs up if you're having any uh, problems with the volume, because no, there's not. So uh, let's see a few people give a thumbs up. Renee, how does it sound? Chelsea's on now. Chelsea, somebody let me know. Thumbs up that the sound is okay. Make sure it's not on my end, because I don't think there's anything I can do. So Dana's asking, is there a microphone adjustment? I, we do need to look into some new equipment. Um, I know the Sunday morning sermons, it's, it's definitely hard to hear. The, the recording's pretty far away from where I'm speaking. Catherine said no problem. No problem. Her. Catherine can hear. Chelsea can hear. So, all right. So, yeah, Dana, I do know on our Sunday morning recording, our live stream, it, it needs some work. So Some other people gave a thumbs up. We, need, we do need some help with some equipment ideas there so if you like dealing with cameras and equipment it's not just as easy like get a camera and set it up where do you set it up do you put it through the soundboard which is all the way in the back of the church so anyway we definitely need to work on that dana so i said maybe he's older this year <laughs> uh no comment dana <laughs> so all right i am having hearing issues as i get older anybody else out there well obviously maybe dana all right, well, let's join in a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into John 12. Lord, we give you thanks for another opportunity to meet together, to study your, your word, and we're thankful that we get to study about the life of Christ. And um, Father, we pray that you would illuminate the text tonight, speak to our own hearts and our different situations and uh, circumstances. May it bring encouragement to those who are watching now and later. As always, we pray for those who do not know the Lord Jesus yet, that you would draw them to saving faith, that they would see Jesus as the eternal Son of God who died and rose again, and that they would savingly believe in him. And uh, we pray that as we enter into these chapters on the, the final days of Jesus, that we would see your love for us, the depths that you went to to redeem us. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, chapter 12 definitely is taking a turn towards the final week of Jesus. Uh, really, chapter 12 on is the last week of Jesus. So it, it, if you take a look, it takes up a lot of space in all four gospel accounts. So really, chapter 12, we're not going to get to it tonight. Uh, but before we leave chapter 12, we will be seeing Jesus predicting his own death. Um, chapter 13, we get into the uh, upper room uh, discourse and uh, the Passover Time starts, and Jesus meets with his disciples in the upper room. 
And if you remember, in chapter 13, uh, you have the washing of the feet of Jesus. That topic comes up tonight. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit about the culture of that time. Last time we met, we looked at uh, John 11 with a raising of Lazarus. Uh, Lazarus from the dead, four days dead. Uh, the greatest miracle, really, Jesus performed uh, outside his own uh, bodily resurrection. So, Chapter 12 begins with uh, Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Now, this is interesting. You need to, I like to ask myself this. Like, why did John include like this detail? Uh, there, as we're going to see, it's going to be a supper. It's going to be a celebration. Have Jesus over uh, to celebrate what he's done. So Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Uh, a great miracle. People came to believe in him. And now, verse 2 says, so they had made him a supper there. So verse 1 he comes to see Lazarus and his family, who he had raised from the dead. So they made a supper for him, a celebration, no doubt. Imagine one of your relatives dead for four days, and you're living in the time that the Messiah comes on the scene, and one of your loved ones is raised from the dead. I mean, if you put yourself, I mean, when you read this, pretend that you're there. What kind of affection would you have for somebody Lazarus, we don't know how old he is. Let's say he's in his 20s, maybe 30s. We don't know for sure. Um, he dies, and at his funeral, he is raised from, or I shouldn't say funeral. Well, they were mourning for him, right? Jews were coming. They were mourning for him. They were still in the state of mourning that week. And your loved one is raised from the dead. What, what kind of feelings would you have for Jesus? That's the setting. So they have a banquet for him, a celebration. And it says, Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one reclining at the table with him. I like to speculate here. It, the text doesn't say. But Pam, have you ever like wondered what they talked about? Do you think maybe Lazarus is like, why would you bring me back? I mean, it was beautiful where I was. It was perfect. And then you call me back into this world again. You ever think that? I haven't really thought about it. I should. So, you know, it's like, what were they talking about? Um, Lazarus had to later die again. And so he's there. So there's a, a dinner and celebration of Jesus who had raised Lazarus from the dead. So Mary, remember last week we saw, or last time we met, we saw Mary and Martha, sisters. The text said Jesus loved them. They loved Jesus. And uh, Lazarus had died. Jesus comes, raises him from the dead. And so there, this is the, it's a celebration. So Mary now takes, it says, a pound, pretty close to a pound, um, a very costly perfume, perfume, pure nard. And doing a little study on this, some say that it could be a, a nard that was from the mountains uh, of northern India. And the spike nard from a plant, it gave a very strong, sweet aroma very expensive, and we know it's expensive, as we're going to see, because it would take a year's wage to pay for it. Some speculate, was it some kind of dowry, was it some kind of savings, uh, monet you know, something that you could, you know, save up money for and buy and then keep for yourself to be able to sell it later uh, for monetary gains? I don't know. It doesn't say, we just know that it's going to be expensive. Uh, take a lot of money to, to have purchased this, is what the text says. So picture the scene. You're reclining at table. Now, Pam and I are sitting at a table with four legs right now. Um, that's not the table that they're sitting at. They reclined on the floor. If you've ever seen a real, should have had a picture up tonight of first century eating habits. In some countries, they still sit on the floor, right? Uh, some Asian countries. In the first century, how they would recline is they would lean on their elbow and, and be dipping and talking. Now, Pam is over here to my right. Okay, now if we were sitting down, one time I have a picture of your feet when they were extremely dirty because you were wearing sandals. Luke, my son, we were on a mission trip, and at the end of the day, Luke had flip-flops on, and his feet were totally filthy. 
Now imagine in a culture where you're wearing sandals all the time. And now you're going to come in and eat together. So customarily, you would have something like a, a low-paid servant that would wash the feet. By the way, in chapter 13, what's Jesus going to do? Wash the disciples' feet. And they have a, Peter has a problem with that. Lord, you, you're not going to wash my feet. No way. And Jesus takes a towel and he washes the disciples' feet. Um, Jesus served. Right, And now we're going to see tonight that he serves us in an ultimate way uh, by dying for us. Um, so picture that scene. Mary takes some very costly perfume, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. Now, I need to say this. Somebody brought it to my attention. Kendall, you used a reference out of Luke 7. And you said Mary, because uh, last week, or last time we met, uh, last week I did the Star of Bethlehem, so two weeks ago. In chapter 11, when it's introducing us to Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, verse 2 says, It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. And all four Gospels share an account of something like this happening. And so I just turned to Luke's gospel and read that one. Now, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's not mentioned, uh, there's nothing mentioned about a name, okay? And I just use Luke's account. Many will say, if you do some reading on this, uh, different scholars, Craig Blomberg and others, um, believe that Luke's account is probably sharing a different account than the others. Meaning this was something very customarily, um, this happened a lot where you would come into a home, they would wash the feet. Now picture this, Jesus at this probably third year in his ministry, this is his last week, uh, the fame of Jesus has gone out from the top of Galilee, right, Sea of Galilee, all the way down to Jerusalem. Uh, he's becoming well-known. People are following him because of the miracles that he's doing. And now you have Lazarus raised from the dead, a man dead four days. And now they're celebrating with Jesus in the house. And it's not just washing the feet. It's taking something very costly and cleansing his head and his feet. So picture this. They're getting ready to eat. They would be laying on their elbow Dipping food. Would you want clean feet yes. if that's how you were sitting around a table with friends? So it was custom. By the way, how many of you recognize, if you've ever traveled to different countries, different countries have all kinds of customs that you may know nothing about. Do you know in some countries you don't shake with like your right hand or you don't do things, you don't touch people with your left hand because in this country that's the hand that you do dirty stuff with, like clean yourself. Did you know that? Yes. Some countries, a handshake is rude. They want a kiss on the cheek. Some countries, it's a kiss on the right and then the left. And I know a missionary, uh, when he came to the States and then went back home, people were really mad. Do you remember the story? Mm -hmm. They were really mad at him. And he's finally found out that it was because when he came back, he didn't give everybody a hug and kiss them on the cheek and say that I missed you. He's, you know, some people in America... They're not accustomed to hugs. I know people that I was one of those. First church we served in, we had a guy named Farron Sims, very lovely guy, Vietnam vet. Uh, he had, he said, Kendall, you don't like hugs, do you? And I said, I'm just not used to it. And he said, I, I'm, I'm going to change that. And so I got used to it more. Um, so picture that. You're, we don't understand the idea of feet washing. In some cultures, did you know? Here's another interesting tidbit about other cultures. In some cultures... If you don't finish all of your food, they're offended. But in some cultures, if you finish all of your food, they're offended. And I wrote some of these down. I found this interesting in looking up different cultures. Uh, the Philippines, Cambodia, uh, Egypt, finishing all the food on your plate signifies to the host that they didn't feed you enough. So that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Understanding the culture. Now, I don't know about you, I've never had somebody like wash my feet because they were dirty. But I can understand in a culture where you're wearing sandals, you're walking dirt roads, that you would come in and you would wash your feet. So that's the setting. So that's not that odd. 
What is odd is the expensive perfume. Now, I believe, like many commentators do, that there were, there's probably more than one occasion where Jesus had his head anointed and his feet washed. But this one stands out. So, yes, I stand corrected uh, to the one who brought this out. Am I sure that Luke 7 is Mary, Martha's sister? No, I, I can't be dog we can't be dogmatic. It doesn't really matter, because if you look at Luke's account, why did she do what she did? Do you remember? Well, she was a sinner. She loved Jesus, right? Remember, the Pharisee got upset with Jesus because she was doing that, and he said... Um, uh, she's been forgiven much, and she loves much, and it was an act of devotion. The same is true tonight. What we see this Mary do is an act of pure devotion to Jesus. So picture that scene. Your brother's been raised from the dead. You have him back. And now she's doing this great act of service. Now, so let's pick it back up in uh, John 12. So the whole house is filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, who was attending, intending to betray him. So John has given you a clue on what's going on about giving you this insight about Judas. Why? This is what Judas says. Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now, if you have a footnote or you do some reading on this, you come to understand a denarius was one day's wage. So think about this. About 300, about a, a year's wage. Very costly, right? Imagine that. So he's upset that it wasn't sold and used for a better purpose like giving to the poor. Now look at verse 6. Here's John's commentary, inspired commentary, right? He said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and used to pilfer what was in it. How many find this shocking? How many find this shocking? Mm -hmm. Judas is willing to sell his soul for some monetary gain. And I, I just was thinking about this. What will people do for money? Can you think of some things? A lot. Steal. Steal. Kill. Kill. Scam. Seduce. Stoop to an all-time low, as you see here. Even sell their soul. Remember what Jesus said? What would it profit a man if he what? Gain the whole world. Gain the whole world, but lose his soul. So What's this also was, shocking, though, is that Jesus didn't call Judas out on it any. I mean, he knew. He knew. But he Chapter never 13, said anything right. to him about it. Yeah, is that interesting? Mm-hmm. Chapter 13, Jesus is going to name who it is. Jesus knows exactly who it is. It says he knew from the beginning who it was. They said, Friend, do what you were going to do. I find that very, look, nothing gets by Jesus. Jesus knows everybody's heart. Um, this is very interesting. So Judas says this, and John lets you in on an insight. Now, let me just say this. Are we called to help people and help the poor? Yes. The answer is yes. And it's not as if Christians go around and trumpet that. Like, let me know. Let, let me uh, let you know what, what I've done. We don't do that. One of the best things I say to people is get connected with the church. That's the best way for people to get to know you, that when you're in a time of need, you can be helped or you can help somebody else. So it's not as if Christians go around stating who all they help when and how? If I, if I said tonight, have any of you helped out people in need? Not only do you give to organizations that do that, but have, have you personally done that? Probably everybody would. But here, Judas is objecting, and it may, if you didn't know the insight, you might say, boy, I think he has a point. Why wasn't this? Let me ask you, does this seem extravagant? Yes. Okay. Extravagant worship, extravagant devotion to the Lord here. So just keep that in mind as we go through this. Therefore, Jesus said, what? Let her alone. 
so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. Leave her alone, Judas. Now, when Jesus says, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial, is Jesus giving the insight into his coming death? Yes. Does that mean that she necessarily knew? I think she's there honoring Jesus, just like we saw in Luke 7. Um, if you're around, if you consider Jesus holy other, like, who is this man? Who, I mean, who can raise the dead? Who can say these things? Wouldn't there be an awe and reverence? And if he raised your brother from the dead, it's like, this is nothing. I, I'm going to worship him in any way I can here. And by the way, think about this. Who is it that really serves us? What did Jesus say? I didn't come to be served, but to what? Be a servant. To serve and give my life a ransom for many. I mean, if we think about our service to our king, it's nothing because our king has already served the ultimate price in giving himself for us and doing all these things on our behalf. So anything that we do is purely out of grace and out of a heart of worship, and here Jesus says, leave her alone so that may she, she may keep it for the day of my burial. How could that be taken? In what ways? That she's preparing his body? Mm -hmm. That Jesus is giving an indication, as he will very soon, uh, about his impending death? Look at what he says in verse 8. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Find that interesting? Mm -hmm. Christians do all kinds of different ministries, feeding throughout the world, right? Giving uh, whenever there's disasters. I know our church gives to orga an organization that feeds people, have, have these large feeding trucks, and will feed thousands upon thousands of meals whenever there's a hurricane or disaster, etc., right? Uh, even local churches, you get to know them. They help people in need. This is a good reminder. We're always going to have these problems in society that call for attention. But Jesus here is letting them know, you're not always going to have me. What she's doing is an act of devotion. Yeah. Honoring him. So the large crowd, any, any comments or thoughts on that? No? So, in what way, we could ask in what ways do we show our love and devotion for Jesus today? If she did this act, in what ways does Jesus, we're looking back now, we see everything that he's accomplished. We just did it Sunday. Pam? Communion. Communion. Lord's Supper. Jesus himself said the night that he was betrayed, do this in remembrance of me. Take the bread, take the cup. This is the blood of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. So we have a way of showing our love for him, our devotion to him, is by meeting with his people, partaking of communion. What are some other ways? I think perseverance, just sticking with Christ in trials and tribulation. Living your every day, right? Pick up your cross daily. Uh, one of the passages that I like to think about is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where it talks about we live for him who died and rose again on our behalf. That's uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. So that we may no longer just live for ourselves, but we actually live for him who died and rose again on our behalf. So living each day, look, I'm, I'm living for the king. I'm wanting to follow him each and every day of my life. Jesus said, if you love me, what are you going to do? Keep my commandments. So John, we'll see that in a while. That'll be John 14, 15. So in a couple more chapters, we're going to see some ways to love Jesus. Jesus said, if you love me, do what I've called you to do. Um, well, and at the judgment, he says, but, you know, I was a stranger and you took me in. I was hungry and you fed me. So right. those... Do doing look. things for the brethren, for other people. Yeah. So that's a good thing to think about. If, if Mary's showing devotion here, if you think about how many hours do we have in a week? Somebody figure it out. Fast. 
108. 168, right? 168. Is that right? 7 times 24, somebody have a calculator? It's 168. So, average people work, uh, the average work week? 5 times 40 hours a week. 40 hours a week? About how many hours do you think you sleep a week? Well, if you sleep 7 hours a night times 7, that's 49. So, let's say 50. 50. So about how many hours does that give you for the rest of the week? Do the math. Just Catherine think, did say obey his word. She obey made his that word, comment. Yep. Oops. So say you have roughly 60 hours. Roughly how long does it take to meet with God's people? To worship the Lord through singing, through hearing his word, through taking communion. On average, what do you think? Two hours? Mm -hmm. So think about this. Lord, you have 168, what did I say, 168 hours? Mm -hmm. You work, you know. If you take off 40 and you, you take off 50 for sleeping, you still have 78. So think about that. And you know, we don't, I mean, think about it. I, I'm taking time. I, I know COVID's different right now. I know people can't gather like we normally do. But is that too much to ask to somebody who says, you know, I, I love the Lord, but mm -hmm. I just... I meet people, I read people online, and let me just say, there are people that no doubt have been hurt in churches. Would you agree? Yes. Are there some jacked up churches? In mm, and, and every denomination, you're, you could have good, bad, and the ugly, right? So what I like to do is I like to listen to people's story. And look, what I always say is this. So when I run into people who say, oh, I don't go anywhere and I haven't for a long time, I try and show them some of the things that we're talking about tonight. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Meeting with God's people, singing with God's people, hearing his word. We're, we're talking out of all the hours of the week. We're talking two hours to meet with his people. And that, that's just in corporate worship. And so what I'd like to do, and if there's any on here tonight, and I know some of you have been in this boat before, for some reason you got away from local fellowship. And I see things online and, and my heart breaks but one of the best things that you can do is say, look, find, find a gospel-centered church and stick with it, right? Work through. Uh, relationships are messy, aren't they? You're going to get your feelings hurt, and you're probably going to hurt somebody's feelings. You didn't say hi to somebody or something happens. and So I would say, look, um, if you can't work, let's say somebody said, I just can't worship there. Then I, find a gospel-centered church that you can worship and stay planted and, and work on relationships. And uh, look, if the Lord died and rose again on our behalf, I, I do think this is an area. Sometimes people do love their time, their money, all of that. They hold as as like something sacred just for, for them and their life. And they, they don't think about what has God called them to, though. I, I find this life is so short. And so looking for ways to show my devotion to the Lord... Um, I think it's something to ponder. Um, and there may be others. As we go through the Gospel of John, when we get into chapter 14, we'll talk about that more. When Jesus said, hey, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's based on out of love. It's based out of grace. Um, so this is how Mary, um, no doubt, if your brother's raised from the dead four days, this is, I can, I can picture this. When you really think about what she just experienced, she's now worshiping through these means and of course judas it, it is hard to believe actually when you think about judas what he's what he was saying what he was getting ready to do now verse 9 the large crowd of the jews then learned that he was there they came not for jesus sake only but that they might also see lazarus whom he raised from the dead. I would travel, right? I would travel to go meet somebody and like see him for myself. I'm sure you would too, if you picture this. So they're coming, they're wanting to see Lazarus. But look what happens, verse 10. This is shocking and, and really sad. The chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also. So, some jacked up religious leaders then? Yes. Wanting to put Lazarus to death? 
Do you find that shocking? Mm -hmm. He's just the one who was raised. I mean, hey, yeah, the guy that Jesus raised from the dead, a lot of people are flocking, going out to see him. And by the way, the text says, let me just finish up with verse 11. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were, were believing in Jesus. They were losing their power. They, yes, they were losing their power. And what happens? Oh, we got to take care of it. Very sad. Now, I only wanted to cover these 11 verses. We'll pick up next week. We'll see the... Um, the ride into Jerusalem, the fulfillment of prophecy, the uh, the praise, the hosannas, laying down the palm branches. So this is starting this Passion Week that uh, we will be in for quite some time, up until at least Easter. So, so as you think about this, and John putting this, writing this account as the Lord's spoken to you tonight, not just learning about Jesus' life, but as I'm reading this, I'm wanting to interact with it putting myself in their shoes, and then asking myself some of these questions. So any other uh, application points that you would like to bring out? I, I think some of the application points is really thinking about where, where's your heart at? Where's my heart at? And thinking about through, through questions that I ask, um, wanting to see people who have been hurt. I mean, this isn't the first time we see these religious leaders pop up. Right, we we saw them with Jesus. What were they trying to do? Many of the times, trip them up, trip them up, see if they could catch him in something he was saying. And so I I met with I saw some guys today, and I was talking with them, and and I told them I have a heart for people that have been hurt, uh, messed up, uh, because whether they they were involved in either uh, a false religion or uh, church life or anything that would have gotten them off track trying to reach people is saying look get back to the core of christianity follow christ and in this fallen world keeping your your focus on christ and staying in a gospel-centered church what wanting to reform it uh, one of the keys that we have at our church on on our uh, in our bulletin on our sign it's one of been a, been one of the keys in my own life is always reforming the scripture Making sure that what you teach, what you believe, right, is based on what you believe Scripture actually teaches. And therefore, if you're in a group, religious group anywhere, people that want to follow the Lord, what you, sh what you should be asking is what? I want, whatever you're teaching, I want to be able to see it here. And I could name some people that I've met through the years. They got thrown off track. Uh, whether they grew up in a church that really didn't teach scripture, but just man-made ideas, man-made rules, um, sent them off track for a long time. Um, there are two dangers I see in this life. They're, I'll call it liberalism, dead liberalism, and far-right, even far-right Christianity, to where they go way beyond what scripture teaches, both of those are dangerous to me. And keeping your heart fresh and in love with Christ and keeping your nose in this book, I, I say this all the time, if I'm ever teaching something that you think is off base, come to me. I, I want to be corrected. And I'm so thankful that the person a person that was watching said, hey, Kendall, are you sure uh, when you were studying um, that passage in John 11, are you sure that Mary is the Mary... In, in Luke chapter 7, are you sure that's the same? And and I'm so glad they brought that out. I just knew that all four gospel accounts mentioned the anointing of the head and feet. And I just assumed and said that. And I'm so glad they did that. Because no, we cannot be dogmatic on that. But what I love is tonight, we can see that Lazarus' sister in this account worshipped as well. Just like the Luke 7 account. Moved moved with compassion and love to serve Jesus in that way. So, any other uh, thoughts tonight? We're, we're, keep, we're going to keep it shorter than uh, last time. Uh, usually we go a little bit later, but... Are you doing it next week? I don't know if we'll I'll be doing it next week. We'll, I'll mention it next Tuesday morning. We'll see. 
Have you thought about this new year, what you're going to read? You know, not being uh, legalistic in that way, saying, hey, you know, you got to have some kind of reading program. But have you thought about, hey, this next year, what kind of, what kind of spiritual goals am I going to have? Is that a good question? Working on my prayer life. Working on prayer life? Okay. For sure. Yeah, I mean, the question is, do we ever examine our own selves? Like, like, am I, do I have a devotion like Mary? Am I like Judas? You know, all these type of, inter, when you're interacting with Scripture, are you reading yourself these penetrating questions? But, so a question for 2021 could be, what can I do in 2021 to improve my spiritual walk with Christ? coming up with some kind of reading program to where I, you know, I'm going to read through the New Testament. I'm going to really study a certain book. Some people sometimes will read the Bible chronologically. They'll, they'll get a reading plan. So I'm just starting Genesis and read straight through, uh, end up quitting at times. So there's not any, you know, no one's looking over your shoulder. So this is only between you and the Lord. Uh, Pam mentioned prayer life. I think all of us, I know I can say the same thing be a great thing for me to work on as well, witnessing. I mean, it seems like all these things constantly we're reminding ourselves of, like, you know what? Renee said you froze. Oh, I froze? You're not on mine, I don't think. But... Okay. Um, yeah, I'll try not to freeze up. So. so just be praying about that. That's only between you and the Lord. No one has to put on here what, what they want to uh, work on. So ask the Lord. Lord. I want to grow more this year in, in these areas, and um, we're wanting to... How many know this? The deeper you grow in His Word, the more I'm aware of spiritual realities constantly, Bible verses coming to mind. So the more you engross yourself, staying committed to a local church, but being in the Bible yourself, right, sticking your nose in here, uh, it gives the Spirit something to work on. So... Especially if you go through like times of depression, up and down, valleys, right? Highs and lows. What's one of the best things you can do to get yourself out of the slump? Scripture. Scripture. And so the more you have Scripture stuck up here, the more the Spirit can use those truths to apply in a lot of given situations. So... Well, thanks for joining in tonight. Uh, somebody said too much math. Uh, yeah, I, sometimes I shouldn't do stuff on the fly, like ask questions like that. How many hours in a week? And, and all right, so if you work 40 hours. But it is something to think about when you're talking to people. You know, how many that how many hours does the Lord give you a week? And you find it hard to even meet with God's people for an hour or two. Um, so, yeah. Good thoughts. Any other thoughts you might have tonight? Dana and Renee both say you froze, but you're fine on mine. Yeah, I, it could be the internet. I know Pam and I's internet uh, connection has been uh, slow lately. Anybody else experiencing that? I don't know if it's it's because of the time and a lot of people are on the internet. Um, I know we don't have fiber optics. Um, we have had to call now and then to get make sure ours is uh, at the speed it's supposed to be. Oh, Dana said it just skipped a couple times. Okay. So, okay. Well, thanks for joining in. Glad we get to do this. We're going to keep working our way through uh, the Gospel of John. Um, we're in Hebrews on Sunday morning. So, uh, just a lot to pray about. Praying for our nation. Uh, praying for our own spiritual life. How many of you have family members or friends that don't know the Lord? Uh, looking for opportunities to continue to pray for them and look for ways to minister. So why don't we uh, close in a word of prayer tonight and hope you have a, a good rest of the week. Let's pray. Lord, tonight we do thank you for an opportunity to spend in your word and to comp contemplate these things. We thank you for the generosity, the, the worship that Mary had, the devotion that she had to spontaneously respect you in this manner. And Father, we pray too that our hearts would be open full of worship, full of devotion, and uh, that it would spill over in a lot of different ways. Lord, we have, you are, you're the one who ultimately has served us already. 
uh, and dying on our behalf, giving us eternal life, giving us a new heart, and all of these thousands of blessings you pour out in our lives. And we pray that we would have a heart of devotion as well uh, to continue to serve you and follow you, to worship you and gathering with your people, but also, Lord, growing on our own. And so we pray that 2021 would be a year of growth, uh, a year of drawing closer to you, no matter what kind of hardships, hurdles, disappointments we might encounter. Uh, we do pray for victories, but we also know that we can encounter hardships this next year. And we pray that through these hardships that you would grant us uh, persevering grace, that you would surround us uh, just with, uh, fill us with your word, that we can use it in our time of need. Uh, we thank you for the body of Christ uh, with its faults and all. And we pray that we'd be mindful to look for those who, who are wondering. Uh, maybe they've come to know you in a saving way, but for whatever reason, they're they have fallen out of uh, meeting with your people. We, we pray that we would have a, a sensitive heart to walk with them and listen to them and, and uh, to see them back in fellowship somewhere uh, where your word is preached. And uh, we thank you for each one that's come uh, to get online tonight to look at your word. And we ask your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. You guys have a good rest of the week. And, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year.